And this verse uh, is probably well known to all of you. The Lord our God is one. And uh, that's where the text comes from Mark chapter 12, 29. Because Jesus was asked in, in chapter 12, in verse 28, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus replied, this is the most important. And you may or may not know that he was quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. So since it's the most important one, can we say it out loud together? Ready? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That's worth meditating on. And some of the ways I got arrested by the Holy Spirit, you know, has that ever happened when you're in your prayer time and, and it's like busted? <laughs> Like, I'd be, I was up here singing the song Breathe one time, and it says, this is the air that I breathe. I'm desperate for you. And the Holy Spirit will say, well, you're not acting like you're desperate for me. And you have to say, like, I'm singing this song, but do I even believe what I'm singing? And if I don't, I should stop singing until I do believe it. Now, it could help you get there, of course, but... These are all these little Holy Spirit checks that happen during the course of the week because he's got his compass pointed to true north and we keep getting redirected by the world off the right compass and the Holy Spirit keeps pulling us back and saying, no, there's a better way. I didn't say an easier way, but I said a better way because part of this challenge is all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. That doesn't happen by accident. You have to be very intentional for that to be the place where you live. And he said that's the most important. So I want to tie that in with the, in Exodus chapter 20 when Moses comes down off the mountain and he has the Ten Commandments in the stone. The very first one, I hope you can see, is connected to what we just read. Verse 2 says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Number one, no other gods before me. See how that ties into all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. So wherever we might be drifting, and he's only getting 80% of this part of my heart, right? It could be chunked up. This part's 100, but this part's only 70. This part's only 80. That could be a form of idolatry. And it doesn't mean that you have a shrine erected in your house. But look, let's just be real honest here. These things can become idols. Everybody has one. There is an off button on here. I don't know if you knew that. So you can't turn it off when you're in a restaurant with your family having dinner. Don't be staring at your phone when you're with your family. Unless it's the menu. Because that was true for a while. I have to be careful when I make these edicts. Because you had to do that little screenshot to see what the menu was because they didn't want you to touch the menu because you might get a germ from the waiter. I hear you, man. That's a lot. Whatever. So, I, I th look, you know, like I can't get in your world. I can help you get into mine. And if you work on an exchange, you know, on the floor of an exchange like I did for a long time in New York City, there's an atmosphere that's antichrist in the atmosphere. It's money, it's greed, it's intelligence, it's bullying, it's not God, it's mammon, right? You know what that is? It's a spirit. You can't serve God and mammon, even though your job seems to be pushing you in that direction. But you have to take a stand and say, no, I'm going to influence this environment. This environment's not going to influence me. You have to be real intentional about that. I would get there early and I would uh, anoint my desk with oil and I would take communion at my desk before anybody else got there because that might have gotten me fired for being, you know, whatever, a prohibited transaction. I don't know, that's what they would call it. <laughs> so like, look, you know, this is spiritual warfare going on and the condition of your spirit dictates the quality of your decisions. You don't have to be too far off to make a bad decision. 
So this says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And if you say, well, that was all the way back in the Old Testament. No. Any of you who were bound up in sin and you know what it was like to be in sin and not in control or be addicted and not be able to stop destructive behavior, that is slavery. With all due respect to any Egyptians that are here, sorry about that, right? But that's the analogy is they were slaves in Egypt for 400 plus years and we were slaves to sin before we knew the Lord. And unless we become born again, unless we have that second chance from the Lord, first you were born in the natural, in the water, the Bible says, but you also have to be born in the spirit or you don't even realize there's another kingdom. You can't even see the kingdom of God, never mind enter into his kingdom now, here, in this life. Yes, when we die, of course, but what about now? Wouldn't it be better to operate in God's kingdom principles while you're here in that secular setting? And look, most jobs are fine as far as like, you know, if you were, there's certain industries where you, you know, if you became saved, you'd probably have to leave. Adult entertainment, let's put that one on the table, all right? Well, pastor, I think I could be a light shining in the darkness. Well, no, I think you sh it's really dark, I get it but let's not spend our time promoting Satan, okay? But most jobs are not that way. That, you know, if you got saved, you'd have to leave, but you might have to be persecuted a bit. And that's where the strength comes. We get stronger when we get tested. I talked about that, I forget when, recently, about being anti-fragile. Your immune system has to be tested to be strengthened. They would try to grow trees in biospheres and the tree would get to a certain height and fall over because there was no wind. The wind is what makes the roots grow deeper and stronger. It's the testing. This is for all of us. So it's not like, oh, I better go be a monk and hide up on a mountain somewhere. No, he gave you everything you need for life and godliness right here in this world. But you, you need courage. You need backbone to take a stand for the Lord and to know it's right. I remember when my children were uh, younger in school, and, and they had a, a, a friend of theirs that was Jewish, and he would wear a yarmulke to school, and they would make fun of him. And whenever he got put in a tough situation, he would say, well, I, I know you've asked me that question before, but you know how I feel, and I don't feel like I need to repeat myself. I'm not taking the yarmulke off, all right? And as a little kid, that's conviction. And when we were at the old location, there was a Jewish synagogue next to us, and they were building it while we were there. And the first thing they built was a school, not the sanctuary, because they understood the importance that the children need to get this burned in, the word of God. Why do you think they're so favored all over the world, wherever the Jews are? The, the IQ test that they take, it's because of God centering on the word. And that was Paul, the apostle, right? Now he gets filled with the Holy Spirit and he realizes Jesus is the God in the flesh. Now it's the full package. Amen? So yes, you should witness to Jewish people too. Amen? Anybody here Jewish by natural descent? So, yeah. A Roman Jew. Figures one of my, one of my compadres over there. But we've all been adopted into the family, right? Who Grafted into the root. Paul says in the book of Romans, the root supports you. Amen? So let's just keep going here. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. There's one God, and he's made of three parts, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That could be confusing to people. How could it be one and three? And just at a real local, easy level, you could think of water is in three phases, right? It can be steam, it can be ice, it can be liquid. Same substance, three different phases of it. And that's how God is. Because he loves us, he's not just a distance God. The Bible tells us if we look at Jesus, we're seeing God. He said that about himself. And John said it right at the beginning in the first chapter. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. What did that mean? They beheld his glory. What would that have referenced in the Old Testament when they said, we beheld glory of God? Anybody remember any of those scenes in the Bible? Remember when they dedicated the temple? And Solomon dedicated the temple, and it says the, 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 the substance was like a cloud. It was so strong, and the ministers couldn't stand to minister. <laughs> and how about when they were in the desert, and they would see a cloud by day? and a fire by night. He would manifest himself in so many different ways. 
And then in the New Testament, we know Jesus is up on the mountain, and he's got a couple of his disciples with him, and they manifest the, the glory of God was right on Elijah, Moses, and Jesus. It was called the Mount of Transfiguration. And Peter's like, let's build memorials here. And the father says, this is my son. Just listen to him. <laughs> the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Yes, that was 2,000 years ago. But does he still dwell among us now? Yes. Blessed are those who believe because they saw me. But Jesus said, blessed are those who believe even though they haven't seen. And you might not have physically seen him, but you know he's real. How many know he's real? Yeah, no doubt in your mind about it. No, okay. But it's something happens on the way to your job that causes you to start forgetting that you need him there too. This is, there's no time that God doesn't want to be fully in front of you. That everything you see, you see through that lens of all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And the glory as the only begotten of the Father, that was Jesus, full of grace and truth. Now I love this verse. I know you probably know it in Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Huh, for it's the power of God to salvation for some of the people that believe it. <laughs> everyone, everyone, Diana, pregnant teenager, not looking good. Look how her life turned around. Oh, anybody got a similar story? I'm raising my hand because I do. It's unbelievable. It's not something I, because I'm so great. It's because he's so great. And, you know, the more that you're willing to yield to that spirit and the word of God, the more likely you are to be able to obey it. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God. The gospel, the good news. The good news isn't that just that he died on the cross so your sins could be forgiven. The, the good news is that he rose from the dead. Because when he rose, he defeated death that came into the garden through Adam and Eve. The devil said, oh, you're going you're gonna to die if you eat. I mean, I'm sorry, he challenged them and said, you're not going to die if you eat of that fruit. And look, they didn't die when they ate it, but they brought death into the garden. And that's it. The reversal of the curse is Jesus defeats death by being rose, by being risen from the dead. But then it says the same spirit that did that is in you. So there's no dead situation in any of us that he can't turn around. That's who he is. Abraham and Sarah, they're, they're dead to being able to have another child. But God calls those things that are not as though they are, even when we laugh at him. That was Sarah, remember? That guy's going to get me pregnant? I don't think so. For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. So, uh, you know, again, there's a lot of ways we could describe the good news. It is so important to realize that our sins have been forgiven, that it was only because of the shed blood of Jesus. But if he only died on the cross and there was no resurrection, then we have no hope. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 15. With, without the resurrection, your faith is futile. There's a lot of words that he uses. So that's the hope. That no matter what somebody's situation is, God can turn it around supernaturally. So to say that somebody is hopeless, they can't ever change, is denying the power of God. You don't have the right to do that. So be careful. You might think they've never changed. They might have done the same thing to you a hundred times, and it hurt every time. Well, they'll never change. Wait a minute. You just said God can't change somebody. We know that's not right. So you need to change your heart to say, Lord, give him a revival. Make him repent and come and say he's sorry. <laughs> that's optional. That's an optional part. <laughs> if the Lord gives them a revival personally, they will come and say they're sorry. Amen? As it's, as it's written, the just shall live by faith. And I just want to stay there for a minute because that was the key verse in all of the Reformation with Martin Luther, that was what the essence turned out to be, the just shall live by faith, meaning it's not about being part of the Catholic Church, which was the church at the time. It's, it's not about where you go. The thief on the cross hanging next to Jesus could never go to a church or get baptized. And he said, today you'll be with me in paradise because you made a decision. That's what gets you in right standing with God, making a decision. Not the formal things that we can do. And they were caught up in all the formal. No, Paul was saying, Peter, what are you doing? 
You're sitting with the Jews and you're ignoring the Gentiles. You're going back to the old law, the thing that we got delivered from. And he called them out right to his face. I mean, you know, Peter was a big guy, an important man in the church. But Paul was like, you're missing something here. You're not loving the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because you're drifting back to the old way. And look, you know, again, I'm sorry, I don't mean to pick on anybody, but I've been a worship leader for a long time, and um, I've seen people that did not look like they wanted to be in the worship service. <laughs> you know, like, they got dragged there, and like, do you ever see the picture of the, of the airplane and the, and, the, and the guy's trying to jump out the plane, but he's got his arms and his legs, like, stretched out, and they're trying to push him out? It's like, that must be what this guy looked like this morning on the way out the door. But you know what? I learned a long time ago, and there's a great um, clip on our uh, YouTube channel and our Facebook page of Kim Owens, who's a pastor out in the uh, Phoenix area. We're having a big revival right now. She had the same issue. She said, when I was a worship leader, I would look, and they, they would look like their arms are all folded, and they're mad, and they're like, make me worship, make me worship. <laughs> And she would come out, young girl, you know, great voice, but she'd be like, oh, my God, I must not have prayed enough. I must not have read enough. And then she says, one day I realized it's not me that hasn't prayed enough. It's them that hasn't prayed enough. It's not me that hasn't read enough. They haven't read enough. So I'm not, she basically said, I'm not letting that religious spirit stop me from worshiping because I'm going to lead the other people in who want to be brought into the presence. And what can happen is we just get a familiar a familiarity with the things of church, and we don't even expect when we walk in the door to experience the presence of God. Can I just say, hit the reset button, if that's you right now? Every time we get together, he's with us. That's a promise. Two people. It's all you need. Two people gathered in my name, I'm there. Well, can you act like he's here? Yeah. You'd be pretty excited. If you saw him, but the just shall live by faith. That's what keeps us in right standing. And there's an amazing, contagious aspect of worship. And you could have seen it, you know, at some of the, uh, of the crusades when there were so many people at a healing crusade that were all expecting to get healed and all had faith for healing. It changes the whole atmosphere. It charges the atmosphere and increases the chance of healing. Never finish. <laughs> For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Huh. What's he saying in verse 20 of Romans chapter 1? That God makes himself real to all of creation. Woo. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they, the people who don't believe in God, are without excuse. And look, you can do business with this on your own time, but this is Romans chapter 1, right up front, right in the beginning, that if people are denying God, it's not because he hasn't made himself real to them. In the last days, I will pour out my flesh on, I'll pour out my spirit. Please, we don't want flesh poured out on us. <laughs> my brain goes faster than my mouth sometimes, sorry. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Even the ones who aren't saved yet have had the spirit poured out on them. Whoa! So maybe when you're talking to them, try to ask the Lord, help me connect with that peace that's in there and make that thing come alive without excuse. Because although they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God, nor were they thankful. That's a good verse on Thanksgiving weekend, isn't it? We all know how powerful it is to show gratitude and never forget what you came from. And not to get up on our high horse because now that we've been saved for a while and we stopped drinking and stopped doing drugs and have some money in the bank... I think I'll just watch from home this week. I don't need to go to church. I'll just watch from home. Well, I mean, if you're here today, isn't there a difference between being here and watching online? Really? So, again, you would think the pastor's going to say that, of course. Right? But no. It's, it's, it's for your good. It's, for, it's a principle. One puts 1,000 to flight. Two put 10,000 to flight. Right? So we need each other. Come magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. There are times that you come because you need prayer, but there's times that you come that you're going to be praying for somebody else. Can't do that from home. So here's the message, folks at home. Start creating new habits. You got in the habit of being home because you had to be with COVID. Well, 
here's, here's the headline. That's over. You can come out now. Come on out. We want you here. <laughs> you all love me so much. Thank you. Though they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And that goes into a whole long list of things that they did wrong. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory. Remember, we talked about that in John chapter 1. The word became flesh, and we beheld his glory. He tabernacled among us. And we beheld his glory. And if you want to lose the glory, sin. That's the fastest way for the glory to leave. Because the holy God lives inside of us. And take care of your temple. That's what Paul said. Your body is now the temple. Don't defile the temple. And sin defiles. Now, you know, they had different rules in the Old Testament. If it was an intentional sin, there was one penalty. But if it was a mistake that you made, if it was an innocent mistake, it wasn't the same severity. So let's just be careful that we're not too hard on each other. If there is a sin, let's just, let's just cut each other some slack and recognize it's difficult. Because we're always saying on the pastoral care team, if the person doesn't get to the root of the problem, they're going to keep repeating the destructive behavior. So that's one of the greatest ways we can help you is help you see what the root is. Trisha and I would be watching a movie like we were last night. We're like, well, this came because of the trauma. <laughs> we were just saying it last night. Because that's true. There's these entry points of trauma in people's lives that allow the enemy to have a foothold. Exchange the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. That's idolatry. Okay? You worship and, and serve the creature rather than the creator who's blessed forever. So that's one way you, if you want to do an audit you know, during the course of the week or since we're going to start this on Wednesday nights now and you're going to be journaling maybe on, uh, in the morning prayer time and your devotional time, right? That, that is when you ask the Lord, Psalm 139. Search, am I getting that right? It's Psalm 139, right? Search my heart, O God. Reveal if there be any wicked way in me. What's wrong with that prayer? Well, you know, we can't ever be like Jesus. Well, we're going to die trying. Because that's how you get more like Jesus. You have to die to your flesh. <laughs> and then I said the universal dilemma. You know, Paul is so good at pointing this out. He says, the, this is the message version. Romans 7, 21 to 23. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. <laughs> I truly delight in God's commands. Anybody here agree you truly delight? But, is the next word, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. <laughs> Parts of me covertly rebel. There you go. There you go. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Yes, doing good, but there's this little pocket of pus. <laughs> That's what John Sanford used to call it. It's like you have an infection in part of you. All this other part's working great, but there's this little pocket of poison in your system. Remember that Easter? <laughs> and just when I least expect it, those parts of me that are covertly rebelling try to take charge. This happened in Numbers 11. I'll go through it quickly. The people fell to grumbling. They were out in the wilderness. They were getting sick of the manna, and they started complaining, and, and they used the word grumbling here in the message. And then Eugene Peter says, the misfits, the misfits among them, among the people, had a craving. Anybody know what a craving is like? Could you lift your head if you know what I'm talking about? Because with all the hands up here, they're probably not all the same thing that we're thinking of right now. Uh, but you know what that's like. That, that thing happens in your stomach. Or like Joe Bellotta said when he used to work uh, in a pizza parlor. And was it Bayonne? I think it was Bayonne that they would turn the fan on so the smell of the pizza would go out onto the street, and as people were walking by, they would be drawn right into the door. <laughs> that pizza. See, that's a craving. You didn't even know you had it. You walk by a bakery, and you didn't want anything before, but you smell that fresh bread. Mmm. You get drawn in there. But a craving's even deeper than that, right? Like, it's it borderline sin, unless we're craving the presence of God. 
But Mario Murillo even made the point that craving the presence of God is good, but not unless you go out and use what you learned when you were in the presence. So even there, right, you can notch it up a little higher. The misfits among the people had a craving. So instead of focusing on the blessing of the manna, what did they do? They started leaking. That's a good message. Leaking for the leaks. <laughs> well, we were in Egypt, man. We had the leaks. Well, you got the leaks right now because you should shut up and stop complaining. God's, God's providing for you miraculously. And you're missing that. You're choosing to focus on the wrong thing. <laughs> the misfits among the people had a craving. And soon they had the people of Israel whining. This is getting worse, isn't it? Anybody here when um, Lance Wallnow's wife, Annabelle, was here? She did this great little exercise, remember? She used to say, what's the thing that you complain about the most in your life? And we would all have to think of it. And then she said, now, do me a favor. Hold your nose and say it really loud in, a, in, a, in an inflated kind of voice. And mine was, this is hard. And she said, this is really hard. And she said, you, 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 you need to let yourself hear yourself saying that. So you can remember that it's not like you're, you're blowing this whole thing. I mean, it's worth going back and looking at. It's a great, it was a great night with her. But, you know, nobody wants to be around whining. So it starts by grumbling. It gets led into a craving. And now they're whining. And what are they whining for? Why can't we have meat? We ate fish in Egypt and got it for free to say nothing of the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. Well, you got it for free because you were a slave. Hello? I don't want to go back to that. Mm -mm. Moses says, God has heard your whining. You're going to eat meat until it's coming out of your nostrils. <laughs> A wind set in motion by God swept the quail in from the sea. And all that day and night and into the next day, the people were out gathering the quail, huge amounts of quail. They spread them out all over the camp for drying. But while they were still chewing the quail... God's anger blazed out against the people. He hit them with a terrible plague, and they ended up calling the place Kibroth Hatava, Graves of the Craving. Help us, Lord. Help us. Help us. Could probably end right there, couldn't we? Because this happens to all of us, right? Like, well, look, let's just be real practical. Most of us here probably dated more than one person and, and had to break up with them and it wasn't your idea. You weren't the breaker. You were the one that got broken. And your heart is broken, isn't it? All those country songs about a broken heart, like, it actually hurts. And just because they stop dating you doesn't mean you stop loving them. That takes a little while to deal with that kind of pain, doesn't it? Don't medicate it. That doesn't help. That just pushes it off later. So let's just be careful what we're craving. Look at, you know, we do that audit. That's what they say at AA, right? Do a fearless audit of, of your life circumstances and try to find the root causes of things because God has a better way. Look, it's just that simple. He has a better way. Your life could be going good, but God still has a better way. All right, so I'm going to just bring it down because it's 1201 and I want you guys to hang out a little bit and uh, fellowship too. But this is a verse that not many people have seen. It's Isaiah 45, 22. It says, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there, there is no other. Now remember we said the greatest commandment is you shall love the Lord your God. He's one. And we're surrounded by competing deities that are trying to get our attention that want us to idolatry. I want to make them idols. I don't know the right way to say it. Don't let it happen. Guard your heart. Out of it flow the issues of life. Don't get caught up in any kind of adulteration of your Christianity. I'm the God. I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn truth has gone out from my mouth. A word that will not be revoked. Every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will swear allegiance. That's the Old Testament. And the Bible folks here know that that's also in the New Testament, isn't it? Huh. Isn't that good? This is how you should think among yourselves, King of Kings Church in Basking Ridge, New Jersey, and those watching online. <laughs> this is how you should think among yourselves, with the mind that you have because you belong to the Messiah. 
Not the mind that the world is trying to put on you. The mind that you have because you belong to Jesus, who through God, though in God's form, didn't regard his equality with God as something he ought to exploit. He didn't pull rank on people because he was God. He got down on his hands and knees and washed people's feet. He met people in the pain they were in and didn't just look down in the hole and say, oh, wow, it must be really bad down there in that hole. He jumped in the hole and helped him out. That's not always convenient, is it, in our lives? Instead, he emptied himself and received the form of a slave being born in the likeness of humans. And then having human appearance, he humbled himself and became obedient even to death. Yes, the death of the cross. And you know enough if you've been here a while that we talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of our own habits. We take things to the cross. They're not going to be in our lives to be band-aid. You don't fix it with a band-aid. You bring it to the cross and you let it die. And then you let God resurrect the new you without that thing on the other side. And that can feel a little awkward because this new you doesn't know what to do. Because you haven't ever done it this way before. See, it really takes faith. And, and it helps if the people around you have a little patience with you because you're trying to form new habits. Say la. And so God has greatly exalted him. And to him, get it, Jesus, in his favor, God has given him the name, which is above every name. So the Jews would have all known Isaiah 45. and said, wait a minute, Paul. God is the one that said he's got the name above every name. Now you're saying Jesus? Yes. Exactly what we're saying. Given to Jesus in his favor, the name which is above all names, that now at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. We know that's true. In verse 11, that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm going to keep going. This is it. We'll finish right here. Close. Anyway. Any temptation you will face will be nothing new. But God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can handle. You believe that? Raise your hand if you believe that. All right. So no matter how tough the situation looks, I talked to my, one of my unsaved cousins one time. And he said, oh, it was un that affair that I had was unavoidable. I'm like, you got it wrong, man. You just don't have the right power source. An affair is avoidable if you're tapped into God. And I broke my heart for him because it destroyed his family having an affair. But he always provides a way of escape so that you'll be able to endure and keep moving forward. So then, my beloved friends, run from idolatry in any form. So look, this is a Peter Roselli's opinion. I'm just saying, in our times of devotion, let's just examine ourselves and, and look and see. It doesn't have to be off by much. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. That's what he wants, and that will allow you to flourish. And some of the things he might ask you to put down are, might be good things, but they're not God things. Only work with the God things. And I've had to learn this. My wife has helped me and been so patient with me about this just to keep on praying, keep on praying, keep on hearing from the Lord. What is he saying? Not as what does your logic think about this? Can you keep going? I'll jump down to this last one. An idol is essentially nothing as there is no other God but the one. New Testament, right? New Testament, 1 Corinthians 8. Corinthians had a lot of idols. So do Americans. Okay, it's very similar, very secular culture. Lots of competing agendas to fight against Jesus. But an idol is essentially nothing, as there is no other God but the one. Even if the majority believes there are many so-called gods in heaven and on earth, this is not our view. Now that you're a Christian, Corinthians, don't think of it that way. For us, there is one God the Father, who is the ultimate source of all things and the goal of our lives, and there is one Lord, Jesus the Anointed, with the Holy Spirit connecting both and, and evident in your life and our lives right now. Huh. So look, let me just throw out another real practical thing. Some of the times when you haul yourself off to church, your body is telling you, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I'm just curious. When you go, 
This is not usually one of the nights when you get some kind of bomb dropped on you of revelation or some truth or something happens or somebody comes up to you with a prophetic word. So isn't it obvious that there's spiritual warfare going on, right? And, and then maybe it's going to be that you were able to share your testimony with somebody else. And even though the Lord, you know, you hadn't had that on the front burner, he put you in a position where you could be used. And that'll take you out of that really bad place. But look, here's the thing about fasting is that you're telling your flesh you're not in charge. We're not going to die. <laughs> right? Oh, I'm going to get lightheaded and I'll faint while I'm driving and I'll kill myself. I know, you'll pull over before you faint. Don't worry. This is how worship is. There's just times that you just have to say, shut up to your flesh, lift your hands, and start singing the words. And ready for takeoff, man. Something happens. When you lift those hands, something happens. It's miraculous. Because he is the way maker. There's only one, Jesus the anointed, and I love this in the, in the voice, it's my last verse, the liberating king. Can you say that with me? The liberating king. What an awesome name for God. Jesus in the flesh, the liberating king. He will liberate you from pessimism and depression and letting the weight of the world hold you down. And look, there's plenty of legitimate things that we could choose to focus on. But, you know, I, again, I just put the post up this week about the hiding place with Corey Ted Boom and her sister. And they found out that there were fleas in the barracks where she is. And Corey's sister, Betsy, says, remember the verse this morning, 1 Thessalonians 5, in all things give thanks to God. And she's like, no way. I'll never give thanks to God for fleas. Anybody know this story? It's a great story. Because later, there's another scene, and Betsy was in the, in the barracks, and now Corey comes in, and she's complaining about something, and Betsy says, I know why there's fleas in the barracks. And, and, and like, you know, Corey Boom, Ten Boom's like rolling her eyes like, yeah, what is it now? You optimist. It's like, we have Bible studies in here and the guards never come in here. And the reason the guards don't ever come in is because of the fleas. So we have led many people to Christ before they got put in the oven because of the fleas. So get on your knees and repent, sister. <laughs> She didn't do that. Betsy didn't. But look, you know, like, you can't always see what's going on. But be grateful. There's always someone else that would love to be in your shoes. <laughs> Somebody got it worse than you, so you just have to make the choice of what I'm going to focus on. I will bless the Lord at His praise will. Come on, let's stand. Thank you for being patient with me today. We went long, but... Uh, We'll give you coffee and bagels. We'll bribe you with food. <laughs> I, just want to, I just want to bless you and invite anybody here that if this is new to you, if Christianity is new to you, if you don't understand the Bible, if this message of salvation is new to you, and, and you heard all the people responding about how our lives have been changed by the power of God, it's not because I'm the pastor that I'm saying this. I would be dead gone, long buried, if it wasn't for Jesus coming into my life. So every day of my life, I want to give it back to him because he gave me life, so I'm willing to do it. And there's a whole bunch of other people around here that feel the same way. So nobody's going to judge you. Nobody's going to think, well, what you did is so terrible. You don't belong in this church. Uh-uh. You belong in the kingdom of God. And you belong with this book by your side. Every way you could have it today could be on your phone, could be a million ways. And you do need to ask the Lord into your heart, right? Unless you get born again, unless you become a born-again Christian, unless you do the second birth, you don't have an awareness that there's another kingdom, the kingdom of God in the earth. So let's just pray together. Heavenly Father, I recognize there's sin in my life. I can't save myself. But Jesus died and rose again so that I could be saved. He became my way maker to get me out of this mess I'm in of sin. So I surrender. I ask you to come in and take over the reins of my life, that you would be in control. Not my will, but your will be done in me. And help me to understand your word, to engage with other Christians, 
and be empowered by your spirit so that I would find the road to eternal life into your kingdom here in the earth and for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Anybody pray that prayer? Never prayed it before? Because, you know, you should be bringing people to church that uh, are seeking God, don't you think? So we could see people up here at the altar getting saved. Who knows what they're seeing at home, man. I hope there's people at home. If you said yes to that prayer, we want to contact you. Just find us on, the e on our website and email us and we'll get back to you. Lord, I bless the, every person that's here. I ask you to have, let them have an awesome week to be charged to go out as ministers in the marketplace and that we could all have fellowship together today in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you all very much.